Up until this point, the Energon Universe iteration of Starscream had been a very straightforward take on the character, not straying far from the traditional G1 portrayal. As leader of the Decepticons in the first story arc of the Skybound continuity, Starscream is quickly established as being violent, cruel, and completely self-serving. Gleefully crushing humans as if they were insects, Starscream set the tone for the Decepticon outlook and philosophy in this continuity, and he largely behaves as we would expect the G1 version of the character to behave. If you were anything like me as a child, that presented a bit of a conundrum, because I always found myself wondering how a character as nasty as Starscream could have ever been friends with a character like Jetfire, as seen in the G1 episode Fire in the Sky. That question is answered in issue 13 of Transformers, giving us a taste for who Starscream was before he joined the Decepticons. In a clever nod to the early and defining work for Transformers by Marvel, this version of Starscream's name used to be Ulktar, the moniker in use before Bob Budiansky was brought on board to finish developing the characters. Beyond the obvious distinction in names, Ulktar is a very different character from Starscream. Ulktar is passionate and dedicated when it comes to his scientific work. He likes to spend time observing rare events with his friends, but most tellingly, he shows a deep appreciation for Cybertron's insect life, here called Turbosects, after the G1 species known as Turbofoxes. His friend Genvo, presumably like most Cybertronians based on the context of the dialogue, finds these little bugs to be annoying pests and is quick to smash them. But Ulktar displays a shocking degree of compassion for the little creatures, a far cry from Starscream's unforgettable cruelty towards humans, first rearing its head at the end of issue one. However, I feel like there are some hints of the Starscream we all know within Ulktar. He recklessly and impulsively breaks into a Cybertronian Defense Force stockpile because he wants to be seen by Omega Supreme. I think this is a little bit of Starscream's ego and pride poking through, but it's so much more endearing in this instance because yes, Ulktar is being a bit of a troublemaker here, but ultimately this reads more like a carefree, innocent desire for fun rather than any malicious intent. And while there may be some ego and selfishness involved, there's no denying that the result creates a meaningful shared experience for Ulktar, Genvo, and Jetfire prior to Jetfire's departure. So meaningful that it's the positive experience that Genvo chooses to focus on in his final moments. Ultimately, this brief tale is a relatable and sympathetic story of three friends seizing one final moment of happiness together in the face of an uncertain future. As Cybertron is in turmoil, the moment doesn't last, and Ulktar's world goes up in flames, his sense of purpose and livelihood is destroyed, his friend Genvo is killed in a skirmish with Optimus Prime and the Autobots. Broken and alone, vulnerable to a charismatic leader, Ulktar ceases to be, and Starscream is born. And this is, of course, only half the story of Starscream's origin. But even if this were a one-shot, it gives us a lot to consider and ties in perfectly to the recurring themes and ideas Daniel Warren Johnson has been employing throughout his run on Transformers. I've talked about this before, most in depth in my video for issue 12, where I contrasted Optimus Prime and Alita 1, but it holds true here as well. There's this prevalent idea in the series that the Cybertronian War takes more than it gives, to paraphrase RC in issue 7, where those who choose to continue participating in the brutal war eventually find themselves becoming more like the thing they're fighting against. And that's an important point in exploring the concept of the heroic Autobots versus the evil Decepticons angle to the franchise, where we see Alita 1 and other Autobots at risk of becoming the thing they oppose. But issue 13 and Starscream's origin shows that it's not just the good guys, in this case the Autobots, that are capable of having their spirits broken and losing their more virtuous qualities. In Johnson's story, everyone has the capacity to fall 
fall from grace. The war has the potential to corrupt and ruin everyone regardless of what side they're on. Even a seemingly straightforward monster might not have always been so monstrous. Even without the as of yet unreleased additional context of issue 14, it's clear that the war and being with the Decepticons changed Ulktar, robbing him of his good-natured innocence and turning him into the worst possible version of himself. Transformers number 13 marks a change in artist with Jason Howard filling in for two issues until the return of Jorge Corona for issue 15. We saw Howard's interiors in the G.I. Joe segment of the Energon Universe 2024 special, and while I felt positively on his work there, I have to admit I had a little reticence about him working on Transformers based on the Energon Universe anniversary set of connecting covers, but it's not because I thought the art was bad. I was just really enjoying the chunky, blocky proportions that we were seeing with Johnson and Corona, and Howard's Cybertronian figures skew a little more thin and stylized, more in the vein of something like Transformers Animated. Much like Animated, however, any hesitations I had about the art style were swiftly obliterated once I actually got to experience the story. In keeping with other Energon Universe titles, Howard's art has his own unique stamp, but the style fits in well with the other artists we've seen, so there isn't any massive discrepancy in the overall vibe and approach, if that makes sense. And despite my initial reticence, I think Howard is the perfect artist to tackle this origin story for Starscream. The bulk of this issue is the Transformers equivalent of a coming-of-age drama, and Howard's line work does a fantastic job of capturing that mix of youthful exuberance and wistful nostalgia. Of course, that's not all there is. There's an undercurrent of tragedy throughout here, and Howard's art is equally capable of conveying the darker, more serious, and violent beats as well. And there's also some seriously awesome framing happening in this issue. I imagine a big moment for many readers will be this spread revealing Omega Supreme, and there's no denying that it's a great moment. But there are some others that I'd like to draw attention to. One of my personal favorites is this close-up of Omega after Ulktar sets off the explosion. Despite what seems to be a somewhat off-center head blaster, I think this is just a really cool shot of the character with shadows and this sort of glassy effect on his mask, making for a very striking image. Another highlight is this page with Starscream being hauled out of the volcano by the Mars personnel, and this is just such a great image in my opinion, and it conveys so much story with very little in the way of text. This page emphasizes the scale of Starscream in a way that I find so satisfying. I feel like the scale between humans and Cybertronians in Transformers comics is often approached by making the humans smaller in the overall composition, so I always enjoy it when I see the opposite employed and we get some truly massive looking Transformers that are taking up way more space on the page. And the last bit of framing that I want to highlight is this panel towards the end with Megatron appearing on the battlefield. Field. This is not a super busy or complicated composition, but it's an effective one, with the slight angle to the ground and by extension Starscream and Genvo in the foreground, creating a bit more dramatic interest, in my opinion. Mike Spicer's color work is doing a lot to make the image even stronger, I think, with a pleasing mix of warm and cool tones in the background elements, as well as using a darker orange color rather than black for the shadows draped over Megatron to plant him in the scene a bit more more and create a sense of the Decepticon leader emerging from the smoke and flames. I think it's worth zooming out here briefly to talk more about Spicer's color work and use of texture. The texture work is very much on point, clearly delineating the segment set in the past with tone patterns, also helping to give the whole thing a more retro feel. We've seen this in play in the past, with the most obvious example being when RC was recalling her past with Ultra Magnus in issue 7, but this is the most substantial use we've got in this series so far. Issue 13 also crystallized Spicer's intent with Cybertron in this 
series, which is, I can only assume, to give us one of the more uniquely colorful versions of the planet that we've seen in Transformers comics. The Cybertron sections of Volume 2 were already making use of a different color palette compared to what was happening on Earth, but I feel like the intention is fully solidified for me in this issue, where we get a Cybertron that is awash with light tones that are almost pastel at times. And there's a good chunk of variety here, with multiple hues of purples, blues, greens, even some faded reds sprinkled in on occasion, making for an extremely colorful take on a planet that you would expect to predominantly feature darker colors, more industrial grays and silvers and so on. The lighter color palette really makes Cybertron pop, in my opinion. I think this is a great choice, as it creates a unique sense of place, and I'd argue it makes perfect sense. The Cybertronians themselves are extremely colorful, so why wouldn't their cityscapes be as well? Overall, I feel extremely positive on Transformers number 13, with a compelling story and an artistic execution that has me salivating at the prospect of someday reading it in an oversized hardcover. This issue just left a really strong impression on me. Lots of cool little things in here too. I couldn't believe that Megatron turns into a tank gun. I thought that was a hilarious and awesome little detail. Genvo was a great addition. I love the design of the character and the function he serves in the story. Story, though, as you might expect with how Johnson handles side characters in this series, he's introduced and killed off in the same issue, but what are you gonna do? It's clear by this point that that's just the story he's telling here, which, by the way, means virtually no movement on the body count total, as I foolishly counted Starscream after issue 7, so minus 1 as he's still alive, but plus 1 for Genvo, so no change, ultimately. But the big thing that's got me excited in this issue is that Starscream is in the hands of Mars. And this is such a cool development, and I can't wait to see where that's going. I still have some chronology questions about where these events slot into what's happening with G.I. Joe, but hopefully there will be some clarity provided soon. And yeah, I'm definitely wondering about the apparent continuity flub about Jetfire knowing Starscream's Decepticon name in issue number one, but maybe it'll be explained next issue, or maybe there's a twist in store somewhere, I don't know. It's not like Starscream is the most reliable of narrators after all, so we'll see. But that's all from me. Check out Swizz Prime and Delta Tryon for other perspectives on the Skybound continuity, as well as other corners of the franchise. And thank you for watching this video. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.